Well, praise the Lord for that beautiful worship. That was worth my coming all the way back to the Lone Star State just to share in that beautiful presentation of the glory of God. Uh, I love to come back to Texas. I made a point last evening to get out and get some real good Mexican food. You know, I'm going through withdrawal pains after all these years. I got some good uh, local cuisine. And uh, it's always good to be back in uh, the heart of America, in my humble opinion. You were once a country before you were a state. You've never forgotten it. And I still remember when I was in seminary, it said, drive uh, 75 and, drive a, drive, and uh, freeze a Yankee alive. I think that was the co- chorus that I remember hearing. And I kind of felt both ways. So, wait, that's some of my family up there. But you guys have all the gas and oil. So I want you to know... Uh, I hope I don't offend anybody, because if you guys secede, I want to come and be part of you, okay? So yeah, I'll try to get a passport ahead of time and get back. But as long as you're here, I'm staying in. But if you're leaving, I'm coming with you. you now, it's a joy to be with you. And, of course, the reason for my being here today is uh, a wonderful book that is about to be released uh, that was written by Rob Westman, illustrated by Kay Walton. It's this beautiful book right here. I still remember when... It arrived in my office at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. I opened it up and I looked at it and I said, this is gorgeous. Who did this? And I opened it up and I started thumbing through and I said, this is the book I always wish I had written. And I, I, and I called Rob. His number was there. I said, Rob, this is extraordinary. He said, well, don't you know I was on your trip uh, to Philadelphia a few years ago? And I said, you were? I don't even remember. Oh, yeah, there was a straggler from somewhere in Texas that was on one of those trips. I had no idea that the Lord had moved the heart of Rob in such a wonderful way and then brought Kay alongside to create this extraordinary book. So I told Rob right when I saw it, I'm going to do everything I can to help launch your book because this book belongs in every family in America. This is the book that parents should be reading with their children, telling them about the great truths of our founding father who had a Christian faith that shaped his life. Today, my study that I'm going to be speaking to you about is going to focus, I believe, appropriately on George Washington in a substantial way, since, after all, it is a President's Day tomorrow. And uh, unfortunately, they celebrate it now as President's Day. All the presidents have been homogenized into one. I want you to note a few of them are better than others. We should have kept Washington and Lincoln's birthday, in my humble opinion, but we're going to celebrate all of them, but we'll especially remember Washington here. And as we talk about Washington today, I want to be very careful to realize I have been granted the great privilege to be in a pulpit where the Word of God is to be proclaimed. So I don't want this to be just a history lesson. History is important. After all, the Bible is the history of salvation. It's the story of how God has redeemed a people for himself. But we must be conscious as we talk about history that we ground it in Scripture. So my plan today is to look at our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, and our founding father, the one who is called the father of his country in his own lifetime, among other founding fathers to be sure. And we want to see how both Washington and that great document that creates America reflect the truths of Scripture. Because we believe that the Bible is the source of all wisdom. The fullness of wisdom is hidden in Jesus Christ. And when we develop a worldview, a Christian perspective, that's based upon Christ and the truth of His Word, we have the power to shape all of the world. There's nothing that's outside of the Creator's hand. There's no truth that's outside of His truth. Christ is the core and source of all things. And so today we want to see how both the founding document and our founding father, in various ways, reflect the great truths of God's Word. So to do that, I want us to begin by thinking, if you will, of the phrase that all of us have heard. As we turn to the Declaration, we've heard that phrase, that there are certain unalienable rights that we have, that we have certain self-evident truths. Those are strong words. That phrase especially, that we hold these to be self-evident truths, it says there is truth in the world. I had the opportunity to be at a small museum in Philadelphia some years ago, 
And there was a speaking competition that was going on, and I was listening to a young person from one of the local high schools get up and speak, and they said, well, our declaration has this phrase about the self-evident truths. But today we know there are no truths. There is not truth. That person was reflecting postmodern ideology. I almost felt like standing up and asking the question, is that true? I mean, it's amazing when someone is espousing something and saying there's no truth, and the only way we can take them seriously is if it's true. But if it's true, it's a self-defeating argument. And so it's a fascinating place that we're in. People want to pretend there's no truth. We want to suppress the truth. We want to run from it. But the Christian worldview that we have says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That's Jesus. That's John chapter 8 and verse 32. In Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the capital of my state, Pennsylvania, when you go into the Senate chamber and you're standing where the speaker stands up and you look up into the beautiful ceiling, there's a beautiful plaque in bronze that says, the truth shall set you free. It is a reminder that an earlier generation knew that God's truth was the basis of all truth, including the truth of government. That a speaker of this lofty place of legislation needed to remember that God is the source of truth. As Christians, when we present the gospel, we unashamedly declare what Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. Jesus does not say he is a truth. One among many. It is not the indefinite. It is a definite article. The truth by which one will know God. Truth is inherently bound up in Jesus Christ. Where Christians go, we bring the truth of the Scriptures. We remember how Jesus prayed in that incredible prayer of John 17. Father, sanctify them through Your Word. Your Word is truth. And so the Christian worldview encounters a world that denies truth, but we say Truth is real. Now, why is that important for us? Because this great document that says there are self-evident truths is the beginning of American liberty. Truth and liberty go together. The truth shall make you free. Self-evident truth is a reflection of a God who is self-authenticating, who proclaims His very truth by presenting His Word through His people who engaged the world and our founding fathers understood that truth was what made them have the courage to start a new nation based upon principles that would reflect justice. Now notice secondly, as we think about this great founding document, not only does it attest the idea of self-evident truths, but it clearly is reflecting the fact that God is essential to the understanding of what they're about to do. There are four references to deity in the Declaration of Independence. And so I want to take another text for a moment. Do you remember Peter at Caesarea Philippi? Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And then Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood did not figure this out, but my father through His Spirit, has revealed this to you. What an amazing moment. And then Jesus begins to describe the plan of salvation that includes His turning His face to Jerusalem, where He will be crucified and be raised on the third day. And the very mouth that proclaimed that Jesus was the Son of God said, Not so, Lord! And Jesus says, Get thee behind me, Satan. For you are concerned about the things of men and not the things of God. Isn't that amazing? The same mouth that's speaking for heaven a moment later is speaking for hell. When we are only concerned about the things of men, we are distorting the entire universe. Because there is not one single fact in the entire universe that does not reflect the God who created it. God is the source of all truth. God is the creator. And so our founders say it so beautifully. 
They say we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's the first reference to deity. It says that we speak of the laws of nature and of nature's God. It's not just Sir Isaac Newton's laws of physics, but it's the God who put physics into the universe, into the cosmos. There is the God of nature. There is a God who is a lawgiver. Further, a fourth, third reference says this, and for the rectitude of our intentions, they're getting ready to stand against a king that they are convinced has become a tyrant because he's taken away the just rights that were constitutionally protected. He's overthrowing the Constitution. He's becoming a despot. And they're going to stand against him. And they say, for the rectitude of our intentions, we appeal to the supreme judge of the world. The supreme judge of the world. What did that mean then? They all knew what the Scriptures say. The day will come when the judge will sit upon his throne and he will judge the nations. He will separate the sheep from the goats. They all knew that John's Gospel says, all judgment has been given by the Father to the Son that you might honor the Son even as you honor the Father. This is a direct reference to the judicial character of Jesus Christ, the great supreme judge of the world. Did you know that Jesus is in our Declaration of Independence? There he is, the third reference to deity. And then finally, at the end of this extraordinary doc document that goes through and lists all of the abuses by the king, he set aside courts, he's making it impossible to get justice. The Constitution has been undermined. He's trying to create religious confusion. Go back and read all of the charges that are summarized by the citizens against their king, who no longer is a, worthy of the respect because he's turned despot and tyrant. And what do they say? They say, I know you think we're crazy to do this. We who are a ragtag group of colonists, who don't have an army, who don't have a navy, who don't have a government, who don't even have our own currency, we're utterly helpless. But we believe we're standing on just principles. And so, for the defense of their declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, they mutually pledge to one another their lives their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Providence. Providence is the belief that God is the one who is in fact governing a history. But what is our point here? They are about the things of men, but they have not forgotten that all things of men find their significance in the transcendence of God. They have self-evidence truths. Jesus Christ says truth will make you free. They are looking at God in His these different ways. And they are not just about the things of men to create a republic, a democracy, a country. They're remembering that God is involved in it. And stop and think for a moment the four things that are said about God. First of all, He's the Creator. When they gathered together, these leaders were creating a new government. They were creators. They were going to establish a form of government. What did they have? They had legislators. God is the lawgiver of the universe, of the laws of nature's God. They're going to establish a judiciary. They appeal to the supreme judge of the world. And yes, they're going to have an executive, a God who is going to be providentially involved as the one who is providentially controlling all things. And so they will have an executive that will govern in history. Have you ever considered that the creators of our government Model the very character what they've given after the very attributes they found in the God of the Bible. They were not just paying attention to the things of men. They're paying attention to the things of God. Self-evident truth. Jesus is the way and the truth. The truth shall set you free. We're not just about the things of men. We are about the things of God. He is the creator, the lawgiver, the judge, and the providential agent. But thirdly, will you notice that they are very concerned to give a form of liberty. Among these unalienable rights that we possess are life and liberty that leads us in our freedom to pursue what is ultimate happiness, which in that day included redemption from sin. Now what we need to think about is that there is a philosophy that does not bring liberty, 
is a philosophy that brings bondage and control. We read about this when the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. Listen. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. The Bible is absolutely committed to philosophy. Philosophy means the love of wisdom. The Bible tells us that wisdom is the tool by which God created the world. We're to love God. We're to love God and His wisdom. Every Christian is to be a philosopher. The great danger of the deceitful, hollow, captivating philosophy of the world is that it excludes God. It expunges Him from our story. It tells us that we can make sense of the world without Him. This philosophy of secularism, humanism, Marxism, narcissism, it is a way of living, but it is capturing you to an idea, not to make you free, but to bind you in that which keeps you from knowing the true liberty that is found in the freedom from sin, the freedom to be faithful to live for God. I know people laugh at the idea, you can't be free if you have to keep the Ten Commandments. You can't be free if you have to follow certain rules. Well, go tell the train that runs through Abilene every once in a while, if you really want to be free, get off the tracks because it's binding you. The tracks are what gives the train freedom. The moment that it jumps the tracks, it's free from the rails, but it is absolutely captivated to the law of gravity and it cannot move. And the philosophies of the world that did not take seriously the God of true freedom does not give freedom at all, but will bring us to the bondage of being enslaved to ourselves, enslaved to ideas that will steer us from God who gave us life. Liberty, according to our founders, liberty is a gift that comes from God. It is one of the unalienable rights that the God of the universe has given to us. The Creator has made us in His image, and we possess them. Now at this point, what we can see then is that our founders were trying to interpret their world and their new nation in light of God's Word. Liberty is based upon freedom and truth. Truth that comes from the freedom of Christ. The truth shall set you free. We cannot be about the things of men without remembering the things of God, the Creator, the Lawgiver, the Judge, the Providential Agent. We must not think that liberty is a work of just our own manufacture by revolting against human power. No, liberty is given to us from God. Our philosophy sees every good and perfect gift coming down from the God of heaven. Which brings us then to our fourth point from the Declaration. A firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. You know the word providence. If you've read the Bible, you can see it way back in that story of Genesis 22. Do you remember when Abraham is taking his only son? He goes to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him. And then as the knife is ready to come down and slay his son, the voice rings from heaven, Stop! There is a ram caught in the thicket. That is the sacrifice. A substitute is found for the Son. And so we find that God provided a ram. And it said, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide on His mountain. That's the beginning of providence. The ram was there to be the substitute. By the way, in the history of redemption, when God's only Son came, there was no substitute when He died. He came to be a substitute for our sins. That was God's providential gift of salvation. Providence is based upon the Scripture. We can find providence, in fact, in a remarkable statement of Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Paul says, For we know. This is a certainty. We know that God is working all things together for good to those that love Him, to those that are called according to His purpose. This mysterious yet powerful call to the sovereign wisdom of God is based upon God's love for us. We know that tragedies happen, but the Bible holds forth the greatest injustice and the greatest tragedy that ever happened 
It's called the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. One who is fully God and fully man, who is betrayed. In fact, it's interesting when Pilate says, what is truth? There was the truth standing before him. He gives him over. He's crucified. What an ugly thing. And yet, in our worship, the cross is central because God turned that ugliness into beauty. The cross becomes the vehicle by which the holy wrath of God against sin is appeased, it's satisfied by the sin bearer, the substitute, the one who died in our place, the one who rose again to give us life. God turned the cross into beauty because God is working all things together for good. This is His providential purpose in history. Our founding fathers conclude the declaration with that extraordinary theological word. Do you realize we're founded as a theological nation and with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence? We mutually pledge to one another our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. George Washington was one of the richest men in all of the, wor- of the known world, in the new world. He risked it all because he was trusting in God. Did you know his favorite doctrine was providence? Over 270 times. I have found that word in his writings. And so it is appropriate that this new book by uh, Kay and Rob is called George Washington Providence. This was his sacred fire. It was his belief that God was burning with his holy passion to accomplish his will in history. And so as I conclude my thoughts from our founding document and move to our founding father, I want you to think about some of the providential interventions of God in the life of our person we're honoring on this President's Day weekend. Did you know that George Washington wanted to become a sailor? As a young man, he had had an older half-brother who had been involved in the Navy, the British Navy, and he wanted to become a British midshipman. He was accepted as a middle-aged teenager. He had his chest fully packed He was on board the ship which he was going to sail away. And wouldn't you know his mother, single mother, George was her oldest son by her late husband. And what did she do? She went to the dock and said, George, don't go. You can't leave me. Now, if you're a teenager and you're doing what you want to do and your mom's at the dock begging you to come back, what would you do? I think I'd go and hidden on the bottom deck so I didn't hear anybody. You're not messing with my vision. I'm going. But George had been trained with such a character of obedience that when his mother said, you can't leave, he went back. He took the chest off. And he changed history by doing that. What would history look like if George Washington had become an admiral in the British Navy and had fought against anybody that stood against the king? Where would the indispensable man have been? God was at work, and he didn't know it. He came back. But his passion to become a military man was still burning in his soul. And so, as the years went on, he was able to become an officer in the British Army. Yes, George Washington was a British officer in the colonies. And so he became a young colonel, and he became part of a whole story that I don't have time to tell about engaging the French in the French and Indian War. But there is one scene I want to remind you of. Washington now is going out with General Braddock, one of the decorated generals of the British Army. They have come to the New World. They're going to confront the French, stop them from their incursions into Pennsylvania, the English king's territory as they saw it. And as they're going through the wilderness, Penn's Woods, Still to this day, trees and mountains, just miles after miles, as they're marching through, he says to the general, Sir, we cannot expose ourselves this way. It is very dangerous. We must be much more careful. And General Braddock looks at the young, upstart Virginia colonel and says, You don't know anything about fighting. Be quiet. I'm a significant general. I've led in battle. And so Washington obeys orders. Wouldn't you know it? they come to the river called the Mahongahela, right outside today of what we call Pittsburgh, then Fort Duquesne. As they begin to go down, suddenly out of nowhere, there are bullets flying at them. There's clouds of smoke. 
They cannot see the enemy. And by the time the battle is done, not one officer is left who has not been wounded or killed. General Braddock will be mortally wounded and will die in Washington. will do his funeral in the road that they travel on by torchlight, reading the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. What a tragic ending to a great general who wouldn't listen to the young man who had warned him. But what's amazing about that battle is that the fire and the smoke was so intense that soon they were firing at themselves. Washington realized that British men were fighting at British men, thinking the bullets that had come from the French and Indians in the hidden woods were from them. They were killing each other. Washington is on horseback, and he writes about this, and he says, I went through with my sword, knocking up rifles, saying, stop shooting your own men. And here he is exposed with French fire and Indian fire this way, his own men's fire this way, and he's riding through, and he survives. He's the only officer that's not wounded. And so he writes home to his brother and his mother. He says, the report of my death is greatly exaggerated. I'm still very much alive. But I do have four bullet holes in my coat. Two horses were shot out from under me. But by a miracle of divine providence, I'm alive. Did George Washington believe in providence? There it was. He saw Somehow, his life was spared. He goes home at this catastrophic defeat, a hero. Not because he won the war, but because he lived. His men knew how he had spared others. And a preacher by the name of Samuel Blair, I'll put in a little hint, he was a Presbyterian, by the way. Some of us Presbyterians really do believe in God, you know that? So that lets us have a chance to preach every once in a while in a Baptist church. So I'm glad I can be here. Thank you, Pastor. Samuel Blair said... Who knows, but God's providence may have spared young Colonel Washington for some special purpose in his kingdom, in his nation. What an amazing prophecy. He didn't know that's what it would be. But don't you see providence now has spared Washington, and Washington is aware. He could have been a midshipman and never been there, but now he comes back. He's a hero even in his loss. And then some years later, he has the opportunity to ride out into the hills again because the British are going to pay this young soldier, as well as others, through land. Now, because Washington was a surveyor, he realized if he just got a piece of a map, it might end up being a mountaintop, just sheer rock, or it could be a swamp bog in the bottom. He wanted good land, and he was going to pick out good lands for his friends. So he went out for payday. After all the suffering and years, it was time to get rewarded. So he goes out, and wouldn't you know it, the word begins to circulate in the wilderness. And unexpectedly, an ancient chief, an older man, had traveled a long way to encounter Washington. The word had come that he wanted to have a council fire with him and smoke a peace pipe. So Washington met with this aged uh, leader of an Indian tribe, and they sat down, and as they began to talk... The chief said, I have been with you before in the wilderness. I was there on that day when the river flowed red with the blood of the British. I directed my braves to fire only at you. And after several rounds, I realized we couldn't harm you. I told my men to stop because the great spirit clearly is not going to let this man die in battle. Now, The Presbyterian minister had given a prophecy. Maybe. Now this Indian chief gives his prophecy. He said, the great spirit reveals that you cannot die in battle and you are going to be the leader of a great people. And after that, he leaves. That's his prophecy. Now a person that accompanied him was named Dr. James Craig. Dr. Craig was the personal physician and neighbor of Washington. He was with him <clears throat> throughout his whole life. In fact, when Washington is now in the Revolutionary Army, he becomes the Surgeon General. So he's a high-standing person. He's actually with him the day he dies. Dr. Craig knew Washington as an intimate friend. And so now we're after Valley Forge. 
Now the American Revolution is underway. The British who had defeated the Americans had taken over Philadelphia, are moving out. They're moving into New Jersey. They're heading toward New York. And Washington plans a rear attack. And as they're making the council of war the night before in their tent, Washington steps out. And as he steps out, General Craig tells this story that he had observed. He says, Scotch Irish Presbyterian that I am, I normally wouldn't believe a prophecy from an Indian chief, but I believe it. I believe Washington cannot die in battle. And so the next day ensues. They're all on their mounts getting ready to move out as they happen. An artillery shell flies in from the British. It explodes right at the foot of Washington's horse. Dust and shrapnel fly everywhere. Everyone's terrified as the smoke clears. There's Washington brushing off the dust off his sleeve, getting his horse under control. And everybody looks over at Dr. Craig, and he does this. That's an eyewitness account. Dr. Craig told that story again and again through the years to follow. He told it to George Washington's adopted grandson, George Washington Park Custis Washington. He was named Washington twice. How about that for a name? He happened to create a play. It's called The Indian Prophecy. It was shown in New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. And it tells this story. He writes it in his reminiscences of his illustrious grandfather. This is history. It's extraordinary. But it is a picture of providence. God spared Washington. Why? Because he wasn't done with him. There's another extraordinary moment in providence. Washington is keeping the British intact up in New York City. And Cornwallis is down in Virginia and not worried about the ragtag army of the Americans, actually positions his army on a peninsula, which you know can be a very dangerous thing because you can be trapped. But he wasn't worried. They could easily go to the sea. The British ruled the sea. And so Washington makes a forced march with Rochambeau, the French general, and they, in a matter of a few days, are down and they trap uh, from the land side. Cornwallis on the peninsula of Yorktown. But they're not worried. They decide they're going to just endure because the British will be able to bring in ships to rescue them. But guess what happens? Just at that moment, Admiral de Grasse from France arrives with the French fleet. There were no cell phones. There was no land to see communication. At precisely that moment, there is now a blockade and the British cannot come in. In fact, the British had been delayed by a whole week by a huge storm. So they couldn't sail down from New York where they were. And after two weeks of a cannonade and a siege, Cornwallis must surrender. The whole army is over. That ends the war. So what happens? What's, what do you do? Washington says, we must have a worship service. Give thanks to divine providence for his extraordinary interposition on behalf of the American cause. Washington writes a letter. He said, the man who cannot see God's providence in these things is worse than an unbeliever, worse than an infidel. He's quoting the King James Bible right there. And as he quotes these things, what will happen next, he says, but I will add no more on the doctrine of providence because I will turn preacher later. Preacher of providence. We might ask the question, when did Washington become a preacher of providence? It's when he was inaugurated as the first president of the United States under the Constitution. As he stands before the people that were there to hear him speak, eyewitnesses said a man who never shook before enemy's bullets his hands were shaking as he was reading his speech. He was overwhelmed with the emotion of what had happened, what had brought him there. And as he speaks, he says, there is no nation in history that has a greater obligation to give their gratitude to God because of his providence on their behalf. This is when he turned preacher. I wonder if he was still thinking about that moment at Yorktown where the French Navy suddenly appeared at just the right moment, where they were able to get there and capture the Navy and the Army all at the same time. And then when the British tried to leave, they tried to even get rowboats to cross over the James River and get out. 
They couldn't because the storm was hitting so hard it kept pushing their boats back on shore. He must have remembered that moment when his army was fleeing from General Howe up in New York. They were trapped on the East River. There was no place to go. Howe knew that in the next morning the British fleet would come around on the back and there would be a pincer attack and they would be destroyed. He said, let's have a good night's sleep. We'll finish them off tomorrow. And so the American Dunkirk occurred. Washington said, we must find every boat we can find, every uh, way we can sail. We've got to cross the river, rescue our army. And so all night long they kept on going, but it wasn't enough time. There weren't enough boats. As the sun came up, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face because the fog was so thick. And by the time the fog lifted in the late afternoon, they saw the last American ship just crossing out of gun range. And they all said that was God's hand. There is no nation, Washington says, that has a greater obligation of gratitude to God because of the signal interpositions of divine providence on behalf of the American cause. Well, I know it's always dangerous to take out your wallet when your preacher is calling for it, but notice there's no offering plate, so you're safe. But go ahead and reach in your wallet and find a dollar bill for just a moment as we finish up. Okay. Now, I'm sure Rob Westman will not be upset if you decide to put this aside to buy his new book, right? He'll be glad. Down payment on it. Okay. But if you look at this dollar bill, wouldn't you agree that even the poorest of us have handled a lot of these through the years? This is the most American document you possibly can have. And, of course, whose picture is on there? Good old uh, George. And then when you turn on the back, you see our motto. Did you know the last act, since this is President's Day weekend, the last act that uh, Abraham Lincoln did, sign into law before he's assassinated, was to put the American slogan on our coins. They hadn't quite gotten to the currency yet, but that would happen. And in God we trust. Well, Washington clearly was a man who was trusting in God. In fact, he wrote to one minister, there's no man who trusts more in the almighty and all-wise God than me. You can see why he believed that. Now, as you look at the beautiful uh, engraving on the back of the dollar bill, you see the great American seal. This was done just about the time that the flag was approved way back at the beginning of the Continental Congress. They needed a seal. The man who created this seal uh, was building on the work of others who'd gone before him. There were three that created the seal. One of them was by the name of Thomas Jefferson. I guess you've heard of him. How about this? John Adams. He helped. There was even another one, Ben Franklin. And you know what their first proposal was? They said, let's have Moses with outstretched rod bringing the Red Sea to collapse upon the Israelites coming safely across and the Egyptians being destroyed. They saw themselves as a people that were being rescued by God. Now, that didn't make the cut. Eventually, they came up with the eagle and the unfinished pyramid. But the person who was in charge of all this was a man by the name of Charles Thompson. He lived on a farm called Harriton Farm. When you come to Philadelphia, you can go to Harriton High School. It's right on this man's farm. He was the only clerk the Continental Congress ever had. He happened to be a Presbyterian elder. He was a classicist. He knew Greek and Hebrew. He's the only man who's ever translated the Septuagint into English. So you can see he was a real biblical scholar, quite a, quite a man. And he recommended the mottos, E Pluribus Unum, out of many one, Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new order of the ages. And he also recommended this other motto, Anuit Coeptus. Now, when you look at that circle on the left, you can see it's on the top, it's in bold print, capital letters, and it's around this triangle with an I. Now, I know some of you might think, well, that's the nefarious Illuminati symbol. But that's not what our founding fathers said. I have read their exact words in the minutes of the early Continental Congress, and they say this I in the triangle represents God, the agent of providence. That's why it was chosen. Providence. The phrase, anuit coeptus, I'm amazed as a historian, no one had ever told me what those words meant. I had to read it by stumbling on it in a library in the original records in Philadelphia. 
And there it said, a new at Coeptus. What does it mean? He has nodded or smiled on our undertakings. God, the agent of providence, has smiled on our undertakings. And they said the reason we use these are because of, quote, the many signal interpositions of divine providence on behalf of the American cause. Providence is right here. And God we trust is here. The man whose favorite doctrine of providence is on the front. You know, you, every time you want to talk to somebody about God, you can do it right here. This is one of the great witnessing tools in history right here, printed by the federal government. Once people start learning this, get ready. They're going to change the money. You, let's get out and tell everybody before they do. Okay, now, as you think about all of this, we, what, will, what will, uh, have we seen so far? First, the founding document recognizes truth and liberty go together. Jesus taught that. Our founding document recognizes that you don't do just the things of men. They mentioned God four times. Thirdly, they recognize that a philosophy that captures you and takes away freedom is distinct from the philosophy of Christ that comes from God, that grants liberty under law, that gives us freedom, and that providence is God's working in history. And this is what we see in our founding father, George Washington, the indispensable man. But the question we conclude with is, what does that mean for you and me? Well, Romans 8.28 is a great verse that all of us need to claim and learn and cherish. For it says, we know that we as us, as believers, reading with Paul, we know that God is working everything together for good. No, it's not that everything we experience is good. But there is nothing in our lives that God is not working by his all-wise providential care to bring about our salvation and that which is ultimately good for his people. If you love God and you trust in him, this is his promise. So let me say two things. First of all, for those of you who have never believed in Jesus, God's providence has brought you here today so that you can hear this message. Jesus Christ died for sinners. doesn't matter what you've done, what you've failed to do, who you've harmed, or how you've let people down. The beautiful truth is that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. The Apostle Paul said, God has saved me, and I'm the chief of sinners. I was putting people to death. God rescued me. This is the good news. Christ died in our place that we might live. Christ rose again from the dead that we might have eternal life in His life. As many who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For by God's gift we are saved. This through faith. We cannot boast about it. We simply with beggars' hands receive this gift from God. A gift from a king. His providence has brought you here. That gospel is yours to believe. Whoever wills Come, Jesus says. The invitation is for each of you who hear. But let us hear also that that providential care governs all of our lives. In the earlier service, I told a moment where I was utterly broke and God spared me so I could bring milk in to my hungry child and gasoline in my empty car with no, with no money in sight for at least a week. But I want to change the image now to talk about this book. This book exists because of providence. And I tell you quickly how it came about. Pastor Stan said, I have a few extra minutes, so I can tell it now, okay? It was the very first year of my pastorate, or second year or so, and I was living at a time when Ronald Reagan was president. I see a lot of gray heads, so some of you remember President Reagan. Do you remember in 1983 they declared by an act of Congress that that year would be the year of the Bible in America? I doubt that will ever happen again. It's extraordinary. The year of the Bible in America. So here I am, a young pastor. I thought, wow, I can celebrate that. So I went to the weekly newspaper and bought a big ad. I found a quote from one of our founders that mentioned something about the Bible, put it in, and said, this year is the year of the Bible in America, but every year is the year of the Bible at Bethany Presbyterian Church. Come and study the Bible with us. Man, I thought I was ready for a job on Madison Avenue. I thought that was so creative. Okay, so I was doing that week after week celebrating, and one particular meeting when our elders got together, 
the moderator of our session was very troubled. And I said, Clyde, what's wrong? He said, well, you know, Pete, I'm with the Gideons, and we've been passing out children's storybooks uh, that are Bible-based, Bible storybooks at the school. You're the Bible. We're just giving them out free. We're not evangelizing. We're just saying everybody needs to know the Bible. And a group, he said, you probably never heard of them, but they're called the ACLU. They came to town, and you know what they said? They're going to sue the school if we don't stop distributing Christian literature. And I was appalled. i never done it before, but I decided to write a letter to the editor of the weekly newspaper and make my case by my thinking that this was utterly inconsistent with American history. Our founders knew the Bible. They were faith-friendly. The early school books had biblical stories within them that the church was given freedom in America. How could they, in the year of the Bible, take away the freedom to give out Bible storybooks? Pretty proud of myself. But I didn't know when you stuck your head out of the foxhole you got shot at. The next week, a member of the ACLU wrote an op-ed article in the same newspaper and said, the man who wrote last week knows nothing about the First Amendment, knows nothing about James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, or the history of the law and the Supreme Court in America. Don't listen to him. He's totally wrong. I was embarrassed. I was angry. But I had almost finished my doctoral studies on Reformation studies. Now, that's not American studies. And I realized it was very possible that I had not gotten my facts right I could have been wrong, and I said, okay, I'm not going to talk about this stuff anymore until I figured it out. Well, to make a long story short, I began to read a book that was called George Washington and Religion. He said, all of our founders were deists. They only used the Bible for humor. They didn't care. I said, oh, I'm wrong. i got to read. So I started reading. But I discovered as I was reading through the book, little by little, there was one biblical phrase after another coming out of the quotes from Washington. And it was then that my epiphany occurred. The lights went on. I realized the man who had written that book had never read the Bible. And he couldn't see the Bible when it was right in front of his eyes. Because he didn't use the look up John 3.16. He's just saying biblical ideas. So I said, I've got to study Washington. So after 20 years of laboring and putting note cards together using computer search engines, I finally figured my hobby on and off and whenever I could would just end up in a bunch of notes that my kids or grandkids would throw in the dumpster and say that was Grandpa's hobby. But out of the blue, a man by the name of Dr. D. James Kennedy, I don't know if you remember that name, he used to do a Christian radio program, television program seen all around the world. He heard about my work, and he said, if you can finish that book this year, I will buy 19,000 copies and share it with my ministry worldwide. You know, that's kind of like gold to an author's ears. He hadn't even read the book. He just said, get it done and I will buy him. It came out of the chute, already a book that was technically a bestseller, and it wasn't even done. Well, where was I going to find the time? I'd just become the president of Westminster. I didn't have time. Well, for the next year, I slept about half as much as normal. I worked as hard as I could, and God let it get done. When it was sent to the printing press, They said, if you put one more page in, we couldn't have gotten it through the press. Since I was the editor, self-published, I got it in and got it done. So that was the thrill. I thought, well, good. The job was done. We printed a few extras, and over time, they were almost all gone. And lo and behold, one day, I got a call in my study. My former secretary said, okay, do you realize that this guy named Glenn Beck, who's on the Fox stations, seen by three million people every and millions more on his radio every day is talking about your book. I said, what is this, April Fool's Day? She said, no, this is true. And the next thing I knew, that book became a number one bestseller in America. How did I have money to get a few thousand so 150,000 could be printed? Two months earlier, a man said, I just have been moved by God to be able to give this organization, Providence Forum, some funds to do something when you think the time is right. There it was. It came from nowhere. A book I never planned to write, a book that was pushed upon me because I was embarrassed, now had been bought, now was being printed, and now being sold. And so as the Providence Forum has been doing this ministry, 
There was a lady who was on her board who said, you know, the Lord has placed it on my heart that someday maybe we would do a children's book on George Washington. She said, I know it's not a lot of money, but here's $10,000. Put it away for when the time is right. To me, that's a lot of money, by the way. I'm just a poor preacher, you know, so I was amazed. I said, wow, that's terrific. So there it was. We just waited, and I thought, I'll never get to that. Okay. And then this book showed up in my office. I just looked at the cover, Kay Walton, and said, this is spectacular. Who in the world has done this? I opened it up, and I started reading. I said, man, this is sacred fire for children. It's phenomenal. I said, who's this Rob Westman? i got to call him up. And that's when I realized that Rob had actually become someone who I'd shared some ministry time with, totally outside of my influence. And I said, Rob, I'm going to do everything I can to get your book in print. So I went to my board and said, you know those funds that we've been waiting for? God has showed us where they're to go. And so today I'm here to celebrate a continued series of providences. I think God is really smiling on the fact that we're rediscovering Washington who loved the providence of God in a country that was established on the belief in the providence of God. And he's chosen to open one door after another, not because we're smart enough to plan it, but because he's doing this. And so, Rob and Kay, I'm, I'm just trusting God with you that God will use this, as Ephesians 3.20 says, above and beyond all we can ask or think according to his power that's at work within us through all generations. God is at work. He's doing something. Now, this is a crazy story in my life, but you know what? One of the beautiful things every Christian can look at is that God is leading in our lives to accomplish his purpose. Some things we may not see how they fit together, but when we get to glory... Just like when we get to a vast mountaintop and we can look back at the vista where we've walked, we'll suddenly see how all those things come together. Say, that's what God was doing. I had no idea. Today, one of the beauties of the gospel is that Christ came to save us. Christ died and rose again, giving life by faith. Come and receive that providential gift that God brought you here to hear the gospel. But secondly, if you're a believer in Christ... Do not believe that God stopped caring about you once you became a Christian. The same providence that was at work in your life so that you heard about the gospel of Jesus, so that he touched your life, he's still working in your life. He loves us with a love that we cannot understand. He says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. He comes to give us everlasting life. This work of grace is at work right now. And so when we are committed to the providence of God, Like George Washington, we can step out into danger and not be afraid and know that we will not lose what God has given to us. We will fulfill all that he's called us to. When we step out in danger, whatever the difficulty, the uncertainty might be, when we pray and put our hands in God, we are able to recognize that God is going to do something that glorifies him and brings us to himself with joy. That is the joy that is our strength that's in the gospel and providential care of God. I conclude simply by saying, providence is not just for preachers. Providence is not just for presidents and patriots. Providence is for the people of God, every one of us. Do you know how I know that? He sees every sparrow that falls to the ground. Are you not worth much more than that? He knows every hair on your head. Now, I know some heads are easier to count of hairs than others. But when you combed your hair this morning and pulled out a few, he changed the number. All of our days are in his hands and care. The heartaches, the blessings, the uncertainties. Step forth boldly because this God of providence is working his good plan out in each of our lives because we belong to him. More secure is no one ever than the loved ones of the Savior. God, would you please bless us now as we invite those who have now put their faith in you, to do so today. Amen. Pastor Stan. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Congregation, let's stand. Danny is going to come and lead us in a hymn of commitment. We have learned about our founding father, our first president.
We worship the president of the universe. Maybe you've never placed your faith in Christ. But maybe somebody shared Christ with you this week. And for the first time in your life, you understood that what he did at the cross, at the empty tomb, he did for you. And you placed your trust in him. And you'd like to declare that publicly this morning. We'd love to rejoice with you. It could be you need some help in doing this. Maybe somebody needs to just sit down with you and and walk with you uh, through the steps of trusting Christ. We'd love to do that. Maybe you're here today, you're looking for a church family, a church, church home. Maybe you're new in Abilene. You have a new house, a new address, but you don't have a church family yet. The move isn't complete until you find that church family. And if the Lord is leading you to Pioneer Drive, we'd love to be that place for you and that home for you. However God might be leading, if you need to make a commitment public today, this is the time. Jeff and I will be here to receive you. More importantly, the Lord is waiting. You come as we sing together.